Hi students, welcome to HSC Chemistry and Module 8, Applying Chemical Ideas. This is video number 15 and the last in our series of spectroscopy and this time we're going to focus on infrared spectroscopy. So we've looked at a number of different spectroscopic techniques in order to analyse the structure of simple organic compounds, but um, this is the final one that we want to look at in terms of uh, infrared spectroscopy and hopefully by the time we've uh, got this one under our belts, we should be able to look at data from all these different types of outputs and use different uh, pieces of information to help us put together the identities of some of these organic compounds. You will have noticed for some of these techniques that they can be a little ambiguous, they can give us some information but not necessarily all of the information that we need and so the best case scenario is for us to actually start to put some of these uh, bits of evidence together to help us to build a picture of exactly what sort of uh, molecules we are looking at. So as with so many of the other types of spectroscopy that we've looked at before, what we do with infrared spectroscopy is we fire in electromagnetic radiation uh, at our molecules and we see what happens um, in terms of the absorption of that uh, particular type of EMR. As far as the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum is concerned, the absorbance is affected by the type of bonds that occur within a molecule and the types of atoms that are attached um, to that bond or by the bond. Covalent bonds that are hit by infrared radiation vibrate depending on the strength of the bond and the mass of the atoms. And we have all these kinds of wiggling, twisting, stretching effects that occur as a result of that. So the, the Infrared, um, uh, infrared radiation that is being absorbed by the molecule is causing um, molecules to wiggle, to stretch, to bend, uh, to scissor. It's not important that you know exactly what's going on in each of these situations. What is important is that depending on what happens, that can change the output and therefore that can give us a little bit of information about the nature of the bonds and the types of atoms that are attached uh, as a result. And so again, as we've looked at previously with all these different types of spectroscopy, what we are interested in is, is not so much uh, a deep understanding of how each of these techniques works, but more how we can use the data in order to identify the identity of different types of uh, organic compounds. So let's look at some output. The one that I guess you're always going to be looking for first is the OH group. And the um, hydroxyl group occurs in a region of the infrared spectra which can confuse it with certain other types of bonds. But the hydroxyl group always stands out because it's a very broad trough. And you may remember that I've previously talked about the fact that sometimes when we look at the output from these spectroscopy techniques, we're actually looking at troughs rather than peaks. Sometimes we'll get peaks, which is telling us about the absorbance. Sometimes we get troughs, which is also telling us about the amount that's absorbed or about the amount that's been transmitted. So therefore, if we look at 100% being transmitted as our baseline and then um, moving away from that, if some of that is absorbed, that means that not the full 100% will actually pass through. And so that's how we create these troughs. And you will see troughs in IR output, as you'll see in the next slide. The amine group are the little vampire fangs. Um, so if you look at two sharp peaks, uh, as opposed to the broad peak or trough that we saw for the hydroxyl group, that's telling you about an amine. Um, a knockout fang is a secondary amine, and secondary amines uh, occur exactly the same as secondary alcohols. That means that they're attached to a carbon that is attached to two other carbons. There's also a terminal alkyne, um, which is another way of getting this little knockout thing. And then there's the hairy beard, which is a sign for the carboxylic acid. Now it's probably good in terms of, as with most of the tricks that you use to help you um, identify what you're looking for, um, it's useful for you to keep that. It's not necessarily useful uh, for you to talk about the smooth tongue or the hairy beard when you're identifying uh, your 
different functional groups in an exam, but just make sure that you identify where those are located, the particular shape that tells you that it is a carboxylic acid or it is an alcohol, and that um, we can, and usually using that sort of data, we can go from there to, um, uh, to construct some evidence for what it is that we've concluded uh, is the identity of a molecule. So let's actually have a look at an output. So here is the IR spectra for butan 2 own or 2 butan own You can see firstly the broad tongue that we would expect um, occurring. So here is the, uh, again, the output from the data sheet. And when you look at the output from the data sheet, the OH groups are up in the 3200 mark. Um, but so are the carbon hydrogen bonds. And this is the problem is when you see a value around here, are you looking at carbon hydrogen bonds or are you looking at the hydroxyl group bonds? And that's why we need to remember that if it's a hydroxyl group, um, the, the output is much broader, not the spike. So the fact that we have no tongue means we do not have the OH group. So that's definitely out. And that's kind of good because butan 2 own would not have it. What butan 2 own does have is a double bonded oxygen to a carbon. So if we were to draw that, but means four. So I'll put my four carbons in. Two is where the functional group is. And the unknown bit means it's a double bonded oxygen. Uh, there's no other parts to this name so I can just assume that everything else uh, will be a hydrogen so now that we've drawn this molecule let's see if our infrared display actually helps us to identify all of these things So we've already said that this region around the 3000 mark is our carbon hydrogen bond. We certainly have plenty of those. We've got this really uh, nice peak down at around 1718. And what you can notice is that that peak around 17, uh, 1718 falls beautifully into the range for our carbon double bonded oxygen. We definitely have one of those. So we have one of those. We've identified one of these. We've got this whole mess in this little region here. I uh, have to say, sometimes this can be a little bit tricky for you to um, interpret. For example, we've got a carbon-carbon a bonds. And we know that there are definitely carbon-carbon bonds, and they occur between 750 and 1100. And there's a few of those in there. Um, also, in this region, we would sometimes find carbon-carbon double bonds. That's really sitting in the 1620 to 1680 region so that's really more up here and you can see there's really not much going on up here but what about the carbon oxygen bonds between a thousand and 1300 sort of hard to detect what's going on here so again as we've talked about previously there can be some ambiguities that you're looking at when you start to analyze these different types of spectra. Sometimes because the regions overlap, you need more than one type of spectra in order to pull all of these together. So I think what we probably need to do is to have one final um, video in this series, which looks at all of these spectra together and how we interpret them um, in order to build a picture of exactly what molecule we have. IR are a bit of fun and usually they have a nice output that gives us some nice clear regions and obviously what you want to do is look at a range of different compounds in order to try and get a sense of how each of the spectra differs for different sets of compounds and that's something that we will have to do uh, a little bit more of during class time. But thanks for watching.